So T, I think this chart showing here actually is really against what you have achieved. Uh, as an Asian woman, you know, well, that's supposed to go down, you know, the slope going downward. How you, you know, rise to the top executive in firm? How you view it from your personal experience? I feel like the chart made me feel very special at the moment. <laughs> um, I think what I noticed is that as I managed um, hundreds of people in my years of managing people, um, I think one of the highest quality of Asian uh, culture or personality is being humble and uh, not to brag about their accomplishment. Um, and when coming to corporate America, you can see that sometimes is holding the advancement of um, an Asian professional. For example, every time we have a meeting, and if I'm sitting at the head of the table waiting for everyone to come in, um, the chairs in the front closer to the executive tend to be filled out with non-Asian, and gradually the Asian people would come in and they actually would prefer to sit way in the back and just listening in, but not so much be active. And um, it's just the way it is, you know, from a racial perspective, that's, you can see. And as part of developing my team, I always encourage people to actually um, take a seat at the table and don't think that it doesn't belong to them and, and that they're not gonna look like they're too arrogant by picking the seat in the front. And also trying to contribute at least once or twice during the meeting so their voice can be heard. And I think that some of these cultural gap, you know, I, I feel like if we can be conscious about it and really have to acknowledge that this is how things work in corporate America and not feeling ashamed that you're doing something that is against your nature would really help you to go a long, long way. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, I think all of us tend to like to disappear. That leads to my second question. It's really the, uh, <clears throat> Somebody say that Asian community, Asian engineers don't have the executive presence, right? Uh, and then what puzzles to me is what exactly is executive presence? It, it, I mean, what's the tangible and intangible part of that concept? But so um, I know we talked about this a little earlier, but I'll, I'll throw in another wrinkle here. <laughs> he has no idea what I'm going to say here. <laughs> Um, I, uh, l let, me, let me paraphrase your question another way, and then I'll answer your question. Um, uh, the, the general narrative is that the model minority doesn't have executive presence. And um, uh, generally that's true. Executive presence, to me, I, with a lot of definitions, the one I always like is you, you know it when you see it. And what it means is, is somebody who carries, them, carries him or herself physically and behaviorally in a way that projects confidence and competence. Okay? Competence and confidence. You can do, you, you can do one or the other, different people. Confidence, but a BSer is not good. You know, competence and and somebody who's quiet is also not good. So it has a competence and confidence. And to me, that's executive presence, uh, the willingness to make decisions, the willingness to, to believe what you what you say, and the willingness to say it in a way that that makes a makes a difference. So so, Bunk, I see a slightly different view. Uh, you know. Chinese people back in China, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, I see a lot of people that have very high executive presence. You can see it. But just because some of these people move here to the US, uh, I find it hard to imagine they lose it. Right. There's a lot, of character, a lot of charismatic people in China. So is, your definition, speech, I, is your definition of uh, executive presence the same as what Bob just said, confidence and confidence? Well, that's part of it. 
is part of it. Uh, it's also uh, how you look, right? Uh, people make impressions of you, uh, whether you know that or not. Right? Whether you say anything or not, it doesn't matter. You walk into a room, other people will have impressions of you, and they'll have these impressions very quickly, based on the way you walk, the way you make eye contact, right? you demeanor, the way you dress, and, and, and if you walk around, if I walk around, right, like this, with my head down, I sit in the back of the room, say nothing, well, that EP is non-existent. And, and I suspect that person who does that here probably does that in China too. But, but you come here, I think you need to, you know, pick up something. You should value your Eastern cultures, right? Those are important, they're not bad. I think being humble is great. Uh, but you also need to speak up, be visible. You have to be ambidextrous. Your Eastern skills is in your left hand. Your Western skills that you're going to pick up is on your right hand. And you have to be both. All right. So, Tia, you agree with this? Um, I agree with um, both Buck and Larry from their perspective. I would also like to add that executive presence, especially for one like me, um, who has a lot to prove. Um, I am a woman coming into a technical field. I was, you know, one out of three female engineers in engineering school. I worked in pretty much mo most of my meetings. I'm the only woman. So how do I carry my executive presence is um, a challenge, definitely, for me. But um, I always believe that um, you need to come with an agenda for the business very clearly, and you're willing to execute on it with a clear plan. And you're not afraid to make the tough decision. So one example for me is when I took over my current job as COO, we have, um, I'm sure you work in a company where people always said, I don't know why that managers or directors or VP is around, you know, he's not contributing and he's bringing down morale in the company and people always have situation in the business where no one has been doing anything about it. And they're just looking around as to who's going to be the one who's going to solve that. And, and you know these because you hear it from everywhere in the organization. So in my first two, three weeks into the job, and I gathered enough data to make the hard decision to, to, to terminate you know, a few positions as well as a part of line. And I do that deliberately and I communicated my decision as to why we have to make that decision and why is it beneficial to the company. And the minute that decision was made, the communication went out, everyone sort of looked at me very differently because they know that I'm willing to walk the talk. And that's always been my belief, that you've got to do what you say to earn the trust of the organization. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think you brought up the, uh, the, the uh, communication as a way of showing your executive presence. I like to dig that question a little bit deeper. I think that a lot of people here are actually, uh, English is not their native language. So the immigrant here, and even they were maybe, like Larry said, they may have executive presence back in their own country, but somehow they didn't show in, in, in this new culture and the new work environment. So my question, Larry, to you is what's your take in terms of communication skill related to you know getting the top executive job in the corporate? And you know, besides just spending endless time in, in a Toastmaster club. Oh, <laughs> I'm actually a defender of the Toastmaster Club. <laughs> so let's try. So uh, I believe uh, uh, that speaking clearly uh, you know, with minimal accent, I think having accent is actually okay. Uh, but you have to speak clearly, and I believe that Toastmasters uh, will help you do that. Right? The way I understand it is they give you a topic, you got to research it, you got to come back and convince your classmates Right, of a point of view. So it's really about convincing. Uh, uh, but accent sometimes I think is overrated uh, uh, to 
you, you move accent because I can close my eyes right now and I can tell whether someone is French, German, or British. I can close my eyes, I can tell whether somebody is Mexican or Brazilian. Okay, so they have accents, but we think they're charming, don't we? Okay, so I think you know, Chinese accent, uh, Korean accent, Japanese accent, they're different. But the real thing is about speaking clearly. Okay? So uh, the other one is you, you got to speak up to defend your viewpoint. Uh, if you hide, like as you mentioned earlier in the meeting, right, you have to speak up. And uh, so I don't know, maybe by a show of hands. So how many have you ever attended a meeting and you did not say a single word? Come on, be honest. I do that too still today. Even though I know I need to speak up, that still happens to me. And, and, and guess what, if you don't speak up, I can assume anything I want about you, right? The model minority, quiet, shy, don't have a viewpoint. And, and so I think you need to uh, think about this, right? From now on, maybe at every meeting, do some preparation, find out what they're talking about, find out what are the debates, what are the contentious points, Get yourself on the agenda, onto the agenda, speak up. You have to every time. Because if you don't, I believe you're doing it to yourself. So, oh. so Mark, on that question, since you're the oh. only American Bond panelist here, so you don't have yes, any I language am. issue, but how do you view as um, you know, Asian community in terms of communication skill? Um, I want to make a couple, a couple points. First, it, first is, Yes, it accent can make a difference if it's difficult to, un difficult to understand you. It will make a difference. Uh, there are uh, accent mediation classes, because certainly with the Chinese, and I, I actually, Kuhn Yun, who's a, a recruiter, told me this, and she used to teach this class. There's certain, there's certain things in the Chinese language that makes it hard, the accent that makes it harder for non-Chinese to understand. So it softens certain things and it's much easier to understand. So you don't lo lose the accent, but you understand what people, are, what people have difficulty grasping in um, the way you speak. So it, that it can be mitigated so it's not a factor. And trust me, I, used, I worked for an Italian um, a vi senior vice president at Cisco and you could barely understand him and he was a great senior vice president. Okay. Um, so it, it, you can get past it, but you have, to, you have to try. The second thing about communications, and we talked a little bit earlier, is not only you have to say something, but you have to, you have to, mean, you have to say it like you mean it. And, and the, the best example I always use when I say this is, you know, I can ask Steve, what, is, what does she think of, of Larry? And she can say it like this. Um, I think Larry's really good. Or he can say, I think Larry's really good. So she said something, but the way she said it said two different things. One was, I don't know, what do you think? And the other one says, I believe in Larry. And, and I, you know, if I, you listen to that, you don't, you don't sense confidence when she said it the first time. So part of what you say and part of, part of what, uh, and, and how you say it, you know, implies your own confidence in, in your judgment. And, and if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be a manager, you know, th that didn't help when she said that. Right, so let me add to that. Right? So I find for myself, when I was learning English, I, I came to this country uh, not, not knowing a single word of English. I'm an immigrant. So I learned over time that I need to pronounce the end of a word just as much as I do the beginning. Okay? So when you finish that word, there's a B there. Not word, but word. Then you do the same thing with your sentence. When you get to the end of the sentence, don't tail off. If you tail off, right, as you suggested, it could be a question. Yeah. It shows a sign of weakness. It shows a sign of uncertainty. So you're not, you're not, you need to finish your sentence with a high or something really strong. So that's one tip. That worked for me. So um, I would like to take that into a different angle or direction. Um, I know English is not my strong suit. And um, coming here, learning it for the very first time, it was very challenging. But I also know my strength is in numbers, graphs, and uh, modeling, illustration, 
because I think in that form. And so usually in meeting, or in meetings, I have problem with S's as you know, and I told everyone about that too. Um, I usually use the pen to demonstrate what I wanted to say as much as I was saying it. So to go from point A to point B, you know, maybe you use sort of like a state machine uh, illustration to get to your point. And people started to focus on your, what you write more so than what you say. And over time, as my English gets better, then that just became actually quite useful in terms of making a point. And so, you know, I, I think that we have to use our strength to help us. And we all here, I believe most of you are engineers or very technical. I mean, you definitely wanted to think with your pen more and talk with your pen because the power of the pen is if you are the one who's scribing, everyone will listen to you, look at what you say in writing, and that's what they're taking away from the meeting. So I encourage you to practice that. But I, but I think, you know, the important part there is that the assertion that you have the authority or confidence to grab the pen to make the point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, uh, HP, uh, because once we discovered uh, the power of the pen, uh, we volunteered to be the scribe. Always. <laughs> and it actually helps you with your skills, because being a scribe is not just to take notes. You can stop a conversation in the middle and say, can you clarify what you say so I can write it down in two words? Right? Someone could have said something in two minutes, seven ideas, you say, but can you summarize that into two, three words so I can write it down? You actually help in the whole meeting by asking these kind of clarification questions. So it's the power of the pen. And also it's establish your leadership position because when you do a meeting summary, and anyone that has question about it, they can always ask you again. Say, oh, you're the one who took notes, so what did you think? And you know, eventually you'll, you become the leader of the team without even trying. So, how Great. So, uh, my next question to Keith, to tell me, is really a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the glass ceiling, you know, bamboo ceiling. Is in the corporate, people tend to have this boys club, the circle, right. and you are minority female. But how do you do? You see those boys club? Are those really important for one to be getting the top job? And if it is, how do you crack it? Well, this question reminds me when I was little and trying to get into the boys' playhouse in the tree, and nobody <laughs> let me in. But uh, I still couldn't get in. But anyway, um, I actually do think that uh, in order for you to be successful in business, you need to have the ability to socialize. And whether or not you call that a um, voice club or uh, you know, a, a niche or a part of organization that you cannot break through, um, if it is important to you to understand how they operate and connect with them so that you can move forward. You need to try. And, um, and for me, um, I actually think that in party, where you, know, you have company events and things like that, I do always make attempt to discuss uh, conversation about you know, anything personal, uh, hobbies, uh, whatnot, with people that I tend to work with all the time. Because things that everyone knows that at work, you always have business conflict. I'm sure there are days when you feel like, why did that person make that decision and maybe they just have something against me. But when you know each other personally, some of that will just fade away and it's not so you know, serious because, well, you know, we play you know, tennis on the weekend, we talk about children and this and that and the other. It's just sort of help the dynamic at work significantly. Um, and uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I think that you have to figure out how you can fit in into the company. Um, when, when there's a promotion going on at work, as an executive, I always poll the other managers in the company and say, do you think this person is able to move to the next level and be an executive? And if no one raised their hand, 
then that person was never going to be moving forward. So if you don't have a network and a support group to help you, then you're never going to move forward. So you have to network, socialize as much as you can at work. And uh, have fun with it, actually. Make it natural. <laughs> Don't force yourself. You want to say thing? OK. You, you go think first. Say, yeah, I go first. So, so I want to show you an example where, uh, because I play volleyball with my colleagues, uh, I got a promotion out of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, true, true story. Second year into my HP career, I noticed on Thursday, every Thursday in the summertime at 3 o'clock, half the people in the office are gone. So I keep working, I right? head down, do my work. Yeah. Where are they? Right? And then later I realized they are off at a nearby park playing volleyball. And you know, approximately 20 people will show up. Uh, as you know, volleyball is only 12 people, right? Six on each side. So the other eight to 10 are sitting around. Guess what they're doing? They're drinking beer, talking to each other, right? And um, so I joined them. I packed up and joined them. And over time, you know, I built a relationship with the volleyball players. And they're not only from one part of the company or my department, they're from different parts of the company. And I got to know a, uh, a division product line controller. His name is Lane Meyer, uh, really well. We talk about, like, uh, when we're not playing, right, we talk about uh, my aspirations, what kind of job, uh, my current job, what I'm tired of, what I wish to do. Well, anyway, one day he came to me. He said, Larry, you're going to come work for me. And it was a promotion. It was an incredible promotion. It was a two-step promotion, different line of business. I was so excited, my first reaction. My second reaction, I said, wait a minute. I need to talk to my boss. He says, Larry, no need to. We already made a deal. Okay. You, your boss has already agreed that you come to me. I'm going to give you boss someone else to do your job. It's a done deal. So I got a promotion out of playing volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so you, you, you want to finish that, or is there, is there more to that, or, or is that more? Okay, I'm, I'm, well, let I'm, me tell you, I'll put that up. Finish that one. Stop the comment. So the other one is that you can join the club, right? That's what I did. But you can also have them join you. Right, so the, the, uh, I won't tell the long story, but uh, you can be a tour guide for a non-Chinese into my culture, into the, what I do. So I very often will invite my manager or my manager's peers in the company to my home to have hokou. <laughs> okay. With hokou, yes. Because this way they understand my culture. So I don't lose my Chinese culture, but I also join the volleyball team. So, so, so let me extrapolate that comment. Uh, so actually there's social research that talks about uh, relationships and you have a good relationship. If you can, if you can establish three um, commonalities. So, so if you just have one that is your work, the work commonality, you know, that's a fairly fragile relationship. So the more commonalities you can create, either by schmoozing, socializing, or playing volleyball, you know, the, then, the, then you build those relationships which can be useful in work. And it's important, especially at the executive level, um, for those relationships. Um, the best example is when, so I worked at Cisco as the general manager of the data center business unit. And um, I spent about a third of my time internal with the people who work for me uh, in my business unit, about 800 people in the business unit. Um, about a third of, the, third of my time dealing with customers. But actually, the, the, the biggest chunk of my time was spent with my peers in Cisco in manufacturing or finance or sales or admin or business development operations on things related to my business, but I needed to do to make, to make me successful whether it's pricing, financing, whether it's trying to get more, more people to, to, to sell my product, whether it's deals, whatever it is, those are all done in relationships inside Cisco. And to get those things done, people do favors for you if they know you and trust you. 
So if you can't or don't look like you can build those relationships, okay, if you're not showing those kinds of skills in terms of building relationships outside your function, if all you're doing is doing the work related to your project, you know, you're not going to be considered for higher positions because those relationship skills, those schmoozing skills, um, those in influencing skills really are needed. And if you can't show that you can do that, you don't get the promotion because you're going to fail if you do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So can you go to that slide that shows the, uh, the survey of uh, you know, Europeans versus Asians? There's a line chart. Well, what he finds it, so let me describe. So this is a very large survey. But how many people? You say 400,000 Four, people? 400,000. 400,000 so, people. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Worldwide. So they are measuring these folks, um, you know, whether they are indi more independent or more interdependent. Egalitarian or seeking status. Taking risk or wants more certainty. Direct versus indirect in the way they communicate. And lastly, are you task oriented or are you relationship oriented? So if you look at the Chinese line, which is red, look at that relationship line. It's really, really high compared to any other culture. So why can't you take that relationship skill that you have and build it with your Caucasian friends? It's natural for you. You can do this when you're in China. You can do that here. And if you're thinking, oh, I can't do that, I, I think you're creating your own barrier. You put this barrier up in front of yourself. Be the guide to your culture with your friends, with your Caucasian friends, and join them. Leverage that relationship skill you have. I, 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 sorry, I, 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 think, I think that's incorrect, Larry. So he's wrong. I'm sorry. I gotta <laughs> fix him. Larry and I are big friends. The the task versus relationship thing means means this. Are you willing to are you willing to uh, make decision relationship to the detriment of the task, or make decision based on task and detriment of the relationship? So for okay. example, task task oriented means I want to get this done no matter what. Bang. Okay. Okay. Very task oriented, results oriented. Boom. You know, and you can. The, whatever the dust settles, dust settles. Relationship is, I will maybe defer this outcome because I don't want to hurt the, the feelings of the people. Important. The relationship is more important than the task. So what it says is in the Western culture, it's important to get it done, no matter what happens. Okay. In, in, the, Eastern, um, in the Eastern cultures, relationships are, are as are important in addition to the task. Good point. Thank you. So look at this chart. It was another interesting question. It looks like the risk taking, the Asian community are definitely more risk adverse than Caucasian. Is that related to why they have concerns of getting, maybe cracking into the, the boys club and then looking for the next promotion actively? Um, I think um, a lot of people think of risk as a way to not do something. Um, I think that the Asian culture, I think there are many successful business um, people in Asia. I mean, it's just like, you know, if you look at the financial status and the spending and the savings, I mean, it's just, they, they seem to understand the formula of making money very well. But when I work with a few of my um, Asian friends and they seem to think like, oh, I'm not sure we wanted to make that decision here in this company and here are the 10 reasons why uh, we shouldn't do that. Um, so when I started to work at HP, so I started to work at uh, a startup company with a Taiwanese uh, founder and uh, it went really great and then we went IPO after a while. but. I decided that I wanted to go learn the corporate America business culture. So I left that company as a director and start all over again as the first level engineer at HP because I really wanted to understand how to work in corporate America. And the first thing on my performance expectation is, um, are you a risk taker? 
And I thought that was kind of really strange that asking me to be a risk taker because it's so dangerous if I'm a risk taker and as an individual contributor. But then underneath it said, you know, you have to take calculated risk. So that's mean that you have to have a plan A and a plan B. So then I started to feel better because I feel like, okay, what is my fallback position? If A just completely blow up and you know, it didn't work out, like let's say if you have a project and you need to release it by a certain date, and if you don't, then something will really, you know, something bad will really happen, then what is your fallback position? Do you have one? And you're always gonna have to have one. And once I figured out that I was gonna have a plan B, I feel much more comfortable taking risks. And that was my biggest learning from, you know, working at HP. And since then, you know, business decision is a lot easier because you always have the fallback position. So I have an observation on risk. Uh, in my view, there are three kinds of risk. One is taking business risk. I think Asians take a lot of business risk. I think there's also uh, kind of risk that's uh, related to financial risk. Wow, Asians are big gamblers with your money, right? <laughs> Macau. <laughs> and the third kind of risk is the risk that you take in a personal way that you lose your face publicly. Yeah, that's true. I think that's the biggest hurdle to overcome. I say something wrong in a meeting, people challenge me, and I don't know how to come back. I lose my face. So I think that's the one you might want to think about. That's much more personal. Not business risk, not, not business risk, not your money when you gamble them away. <laughs> Saving your face. I actually think one of the important things is that you should admit to your wrong decision before anyone else get to that conclusion. So if I made a bad decision, I always am the first one to say that was a bad decision here's what we learned from it, and how we're gonna get out of it. So it sort of take away all of the politics around finger pointing, you may, you know, because everyone's starting to say, oh, who did this and who's wrong? Um, so to save face, I think it's the best thing is you save yourself by, you know, just face up to the issues and then deal with it. Um, and ever since, you know, I, I took that approach, I feel much better about taking you know, just put myself out there, basically. Thank you. Very helpful tips. And I think it's time for open to the audience for questions on the floor. Uh, my name is Rob Chen, and I'm from Casper, and I do have a question. By the way, the uh, panel is a great panel, and the opinion, I think, very, very valuable to a lot of people because you point out some of the very key points. People may not be aware or may not be able to, maybe they know it, may not be able to, to do this good. So my, my question to the panel will uh, two points, uh, two questions. One is the uh, uh, socialization, socialized life with the uh, you know, uh, company and co-worker. I observed that I think Asian, com uh, Asian uh, families, uh, they have the, 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 the advantage of merit uh, by very being very dedicated parents. They dedicate a lot of time, like shepherding, you know, kids to learn piano, this and that after school. And now be, because of that, and also they work great long hours after work, like Larry pointed out, uh, cover other people's issue, whatever. So they don't think about socialize so much because they have so much obligation. I so don't know whether so what, what's, what's your question? That's a question. I don't know whether that's a question. That's the reason why they they, they, they fail to socialize. Okay. Lack of time because of obligation. Go for it. The second point is um, the uh, aspiration that like you have to act, speak up, whatever, step sit in the front. My question is that I do see some people doing that but isn't it true though, whether you get promoted or not, sometimes um, it's actually up to your manager. And, and, and maybe sometimes you can kiss whatever he has, 
uh, and then be successful, and sometimes you may not be able to do anything. I don't know whether this is the, <laughs> um, the, the answer to that. Uh, that's why I raised the question. Okay, let me put this question in very short. The first one is that I'm so busy, I don't have the time to go having a beer with you. Okay, yep. social media right. company. The second Get question that is that really I don't, sure. yeah, I, I'm yep. so pride, I just don't want to kiss you. Yeah, yeah, you're mad at side. Yeah, so, okay. so, so two, two, quick, uh, two quick comments on, on both questions. First of all, no time to do it. Um, you know the charts in slide two? I don't care what's keeping people from doing the right thing. As long as you don't change, that those charts won't change. So it doesn't matter why. You all know what you need to do. So you either decide to do it or not, and it's up to you. Okay. So the second comment is in terms of the manager. Um, um, the answer, uh, the answer is actually there's research said research that says the most important relationship you have is with your manager. Okay, and that's true. Okay, um, so you need to build a good relationship with your immediate manager. Um, part number one. Part number two is actually the higher and higher you go, um, and and we all are. High enough. So I, I would sit in executive uh, promotion meetings, um, and you look at the um, senior manager being direct promoted director, or director being promoted VPs. And somebody's and the way these work is they somebody's face and resume gets turned up on the screen. And uh, my uh, manager at the time was Jay Shree Lal at, at Cisco would say, okay, you know, besides Larry, who else wants who else has anything to say about this person? And if no one says anything. Um, it's unlikely that person will get promoted. So it's not just your manager, but it's building relationships across the com com company, people who can affect your career in addition to your manager. Thank you, Mark. So, so let me add quickly. So one of the things that we say is who, a certain level of the job, and especially at a higher level, who you know is far more important than what you know. And if you believe that statement and you want to get promoted, and you have a choice between spending time with your family versus building relationship with your colleagues and your bosses. It's your choice. All right. So maybe you, uh, there's a long line here. Tina, so Tina, uh, Tina, Tina Paul, do you want to say something? Oh, can you have any added? She can right. get the next one. It's OK. I'll get the okay. next one. Next one. Yeah. She gets the one. OK. <laughs> if it's easy. Let's go ahead. Just a quick question. Uh, as you have, might have observed that uh, uh, quite a few of our friends from India are doing pretty well in corporate America. Then uh, also as uh, immigrants, they also are from other countries. So from your personal observations, what are they doing right to make it happen for themselves? Thank you. Sorry. Indian versus yeah, the, the question Indian is, uh, South Asian, like Indian country, they also immigrate uh, to this country, but it seems like they're doing better in terms of getting the top job in the corporate. Um, I think in my experience um, working with different culture, um, I do see that the assimilation or the adaptation of corporate culture for Indian population is much faster than the, um, you know, the Asian or Southeast, I should say, culture. Um, you know, I managed, um, you know, a lot of um, Indian employees as well as Asian employees, uh, meaning the uh, Southeast Asian employees. And um, I, I, based on my experience, I feel like when we try to raise the level of uh, participation with um, Indian culture or Indian employees. Um, they actually are reacting very quickly and very successfully to corporate America. So I think that's why you see the ramp in terms of executives' um, uh, growth, the percentage of people that made it to the executive rank is faster. And that's just on my. Um, you know, based on my experience, it's I can throw true. Some data. Some data. Okay, I think sure. we are approaching to, we have 10 minutes so, and we have a long line, so let's move to the next question. Uh, okay, next one. Okay. 
Thank you. I, uh, this is Judy from AMD Research. I really learned a lot. One thing I realized that I don't have enough strength is uh, collaboration in the company. So I wanted to take this opportunity to ask for some tips, like how do you pursue um, or talk into like a, a partnership within the company in, in um, both beneficial um, collaboration, like how do you uh, carry on the conversation to make it you know, constructive? Thank you. I don't understand the question. What's, what's the question? I, I, I'm not sure. I thought I heard that, that how do I do a better job of collaborating? Uh, yeah, like with partners within the company. With partners? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, partners you mean uh, senior executives, right? In a service industry, like, a, a lawyer who's a partner, a CPA accountant who's a partner, is that what you mean? No. Maybe you were at all. Just a counterpart. A counterpart? Yeah, like cost function. Yes. I, uh, so I just, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't really question, understand the question. I think my understanding of the question is that if you are a, uh, let's say, um, an individual in this department that you want to reach out to build some relationship with somebody else from other department, right? And, and what kind of activity you can do, you know, give and take, to build that relationship across, you know, beyond your uh, subject expertise? Let me try. Okay. So I heard the word collaboration, right? So Collaboration is two ways. It's a two-way street, not one. Right? So I give, I do you small favors to help you to do your job. Sometimes down the later, when I need help, I will ask you for some help. So it's both ways. Right? That's what one form of collaboration uh, means to me, unless you have something more specific. Yeah, I, I would like to add that for me, before I ask anyone else to do anything, I really ask myself, why would they do anything for you if you're both at equal level? Then I try to understand their pain points. Um, so, you know, let's say if you're in QA and um, engineering release part of too early and, you know, they always have to deal with a lot of the issues. You try to understand their pain points and you try to provide a solution for them. Then you come in and ask for what you need because if they know that you care about their situation and they're much more receptive. But just to come in and ask for favor without understanding the situation is very challenging. Well, one, one comment, I'm not sure I totally understand the question there, but the two things you can do, I suggest. Number one, if you want to find out about other functions in your, in your company, ask your manager to be assigned to some cross-functional team, first of all. And again, it, it expresses to your manager interested in, in, other, in, in other activities as well. Second thing you do is just volunteer for those too when you, when you see them come up. Thank you, thank you, Bob. So we have like a less than 10 minutes to go, so uh, I would say each question and answer to be limited in two minutes. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, my question actually is not related to the leadership because I believe the fast way to be a shoemaker is to start your own company. <laughs> so I mean, so, but I, I look at the pair, the composition of panel is quite impressive now. So I'm just want to ask a, 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 a technical question. What's your take on for all panels? What's your take on hype convergence and hype scale for this uh, big data era? What? Because I was in hype scale, hype data center, hype scale hyper and hype convergence. HP hype scale, hype scale, convergence. Yes. I'm sorry, what? And yeah. it's their impacts on um, semiconductor design. Let, let me try to understand because this is a kind of oh, wait, let, let coach, coaching session. So um, here is that you, you think that the, the corporate career executive can go through an entrepreneurial uh, no, it's also a good way, but it's way too slow. Right now, it's a fast moving industry so, and it's way too slow. Well, I want to challenge you on something that uh, you can't get a leadership role in a large company or a startup company. Uh, that doesn't happen because we have data that says that of the fastest growing entrepreneurial companies in the Bay Area, only 15% are led by Asians. Yeah. So you can't escape. Yeah, I understand. You need, I, don't, you I, don't want, need your own company, I don't want to argue with you. you if you look at the flex, Facebook, and Google, those founders, they never have any leadership experience before they all gave their business to like, bring your company. So, <laughs> so, um, by the way, I did three startups, so it's fun doing a startup. 
So startups are great. Um, unfortunately, there, there's just one story I want to tell, and that is um, I started a, um, a advanced leadership program for Asian American executives at a program at the Stanford Business School. Uh, and the reason I started it is, the reason I could get it to happen is I ran into this Indian professor at Stanford who was about to start a CEO boot camp for Asian entrepreneurs. And the reason he was starting is because he was getting feedback from his a, a, mostly Indian friends that uh, lots of Asian Americans were starting companies, but when they become real, they all get replaced by non-Asian CEOs. So they did not have the ability to lead large organizations. They could innovate, they could be a CTO, they could be VP of engineering, but they could not run companies. Same issue. Yeah, actually our panelists have created a career executive, a career path to entrepreneur or from a large corporation. Given the interest of time, we'll have one more question. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, uh, okay I'm waiting for and uh, let me ask the question. Is, uh, 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 I think the, the executive need to be success. I think it need to be in, in uh, each step to be uh, hold their position. Uh, my question is, uh, for example, like you change to other company and then you still want to hold that uh, the, the, the management position, but the people you are not familiar with, how you can quickly make those people, uh, I don't know how, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, just, just like you, you, you have a parachute coming in and then you, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you <laughs> I think, I, I think if I understand your question right, you move from one position to a new company, it's a promotion, and now you're dealing with a whole new group of people. How do you establish yourself again? Yeah. And I think that if you have already established yourself at the prior company to a certain level, um, it's really the same approach, right? You have to make sure that you you establish a credibility. So when I start up at any new company, I always commit to a couple of things that I can deliver to. So I would say, I'm going to do this project by this day, or I'm going to help the organization to save X dollars by this time frame. And don't make it a big goal, because if you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. A lot of people try to say, I'm going to do something really big, and then they fail miserably, and then they lose their credibility forever. So you do something small, you make it happen, you start to earn credibility. And once you have credibility, it's just going to get bigger and bigger, and one day nobody's going to ask you why you make that decision. Thank you, Keith. So I think we have one more question. All right. Thank you for your sharing, and it is my first time to meet you. You are my first time to meet San Jose. And uh, my question is very simple, but I'm not sure if your question will be too correct. Because I'm not really very, no, uh, uh, really how it's going to I mean, that I want, I want to know the uh, three leaders. Uh, uh, did you ever, in your past career, did you ever meet, I mean, ever managed or lead by a very bad boss? I mean, bad boss. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, so, I have a bad story. Do you do bad I do all the time. So which one do I pick? Uh, well, let me pick a quick one. So uh, one time I had a boss. Uh, I felt that he knew nothing. Well, maybe exaggerating. <laughs> so all the stuff, the project I was leading, you know, I, I provide the specs. I designed it. I worked with the IT team to solve it. And, and every time we do a checkpoint with my boss one-on-one, -on -one, he will always ask me, have you checked with somebody else? Okay, always. He doesn't have an opinion about whether it's bad or not. Check with somebody else, check with somebody else. And I, I didn't have a lot of respect for him. However, uh, I didn't give up uh, uh, because he is my boss, right? So I do what he asked for. So I go check. And, and later I discovered that he actually it was very purposeful. Uh, he wanted me to check my spec, my solution, with the manufacturing folks who's going to use my solution. He wants to make sure these guys approve. He doesn't care what I do as long as our customers, internal 
users approve. And then when I realized that, I said, wow, this guy is actually not as bad as I thought. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Well, so insightful sharing with all of us. I think we have one minute that, uh, <laughs> that I'm going to... One more question? Get letter. Get oh, the time Sarah, how's the time Okay, so I, we, we actually have... Uh, okay, one minute. Okay. Um, I'm a business major. Uh, I studied here uh, from New York and the Iowa City. I have one thing that I've observed uh, through my dealing with a lot of clients of mine in the uh, hacking industry. The situation I was seeing is like, um, I think when you grow up for a technical people, you usually really um, kind of task oriented kind of people. You didn't really look beyond the task. So what you have to do in a, to be a successful leader, you have, when you went to your corporation, you have to know where the company is going, what's their strengths, what's the critical success factor uh, that will, this company will be uh, succeed. And uh, what's also, your question? No, I'm just saying I like to make some comments okay. that we needed to get a more business perspective uh, for a company that you join in order to be an executive leader. And also, when you become originally, you are, a, you know, why you call executive? Uh, leader means you have to take active role. You cannot wait for people tell you what to do. You have to think about what can you do for the corporation yep. and what kind of project. And you, have, you know, I, I see a lot of people. They don't want to say anything because they don't want to do more than what they have to do. But if you don't do anything, you go to the next level. That's my comment. Thank you. Can, can I comment? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Good advice. Can, can I come on, comment on the comment with the story? Okay. Oh, my story. All right, story. no question. So it's, it's, a, it's a Shree story. So uh, I had a friend of mine in Cisco, he was a VP of engineering and a great VP of engineering. Uh, as he would always tell me, he was the only one who would uh, come in on time, on budget, um, and get the thing done. And he didn't work for me, but he worked for another um, vice president, general manager of Cisco. And the story tells me is that, so for two years running, he would say, okay, I'm your best VP of engineering. I wanna be general manager, make me a general manager, make me a general manager. And uh, the general manager says, I'm sorry, you know, you get things done, but you leave dead bodies all around you. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and, and he spent some time with me and really make the comment about understanding the business, growing the business. And, and I don't tell him what to do, but basically what he went back and put together a five page presentation on, Here's how I'm gonna grow my business from a $1 billion switching business to a $3 billion switching business in five years. The general manager looks at the presentation, says, this is interesting. I'll get back to you. Well, three months later, um, he was given his own division and, and with the challenge of, of him saying, okay, you can do it, go do it. So to the point, you have to have a vision of what you think you can do, and then they'll challenge you with that, even though you're still leaving dead bodies all over the place. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for sharing all this insightful vision with us. I think I will give 30 seconds for each of you to give the final words how we transform from engineer to corporate executive. Larry, start with you. Me? Uh, I suggest you pledge to yourself that you will speak up at each and every meeting from now on. No exceptions. I think you all know what you need to do. Um, I think that you read a lot about how to become a successful executive. I think you just need to make your commitment and do it because you are very smart and capable. I agree. They, they, they've said it all. There's nothing more for me to say. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 up to you to, it's up to you to change your behavior. What, what got you to, what got you here as a as a good engineering manager will keep you here as a good engineering manager unless you understand what it takes to be executive. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do another